Good morning. Welcome to Leland Summer Church and Leland Community United Methodist Church. We're very happy to have you here with us this morning, or if you're watching at a later time, perhaps it's not morning. Either way, we're very happy to have you amongst us in this community of faith. Since you are watching on Facebook, um, I'm just going to suggest that right now take a moment and look at your screen, and there's this squiggly arrow that says share, and maybe click that, and give us an opportunity to um, share this message with your Facebook friends, and perhaps broaden our community of faith, perhaps expose some folks to these messages that maybe are further away from Leland or looking for some um, something in their lives that they don't have now. So. It's a great thing to do, and please um, consider doing that. Um, whether you're listening live or listening in our video archive, again, welcome, and we're very happy to have you with us today. Um, the Leland Summer Church is a decades-long uh, tradition. It's an organization that brings in esteemed clergy and ecclesiastical speakers uh, uh, through a summer program. And today we're very fortunate to have uh, the speaker be our own, Pastor Daniel Hoffman. So um, we're thrilled about that and also want to let you know that there's three more uh, week, uh, weeks where we will be having summer church. So please join us. Um, that said, uh, we'll move to our call to worship and we'll speak responsively um, the call to worship. Friends, Jesus calls us to step out on the water with him, to leave the safety of our boats, and to walk toward him in faith, joining him in the work he is already doing in our world. We are so troubled, and we don't know whether we dare to trust this call. When the wind and waves get high and threaten to overwhelm us, we remember his words, don't be afraid. Take the step. Lord, grasp our hands and our hearts. Heal and strengthen us with your love, so that with faith we will follow where Jesus leads, confident that his love, his presence go with us to do his work in our world. Please join me in singing our first hymn, Amazing Grace.
Friends, although we are in very many different places, let us now come together as one church and one body in morning prayer. Loving and gracious Lord, the Psalms tell us that the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are attentive to their cries. Lord, we ask that you turn your eyes and ears toward us now as we pray, for our world is full of tumult and in need of your healing, Holy Spirit. Forgiving, Lord, there are more than 40 active armed conflicts going on in our world at this time. Lord, we ask that world leaders and the leaders of our nation, our states, and our communities reflect your image in protecting their flocks and promoting peace among all nations. We ask that your Holy Spirit infuse each of us with a forgiving heart and a peaceful spirit that we might love our neighbors as you have commanded. Lord, we know that your compassion is without end. In our congregation today, we have those who are anxiously awaiting medical tests and results. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit stand by them with the reassurance that you are in control of all things and that you calm those anxieties through the faith and comfort that you have given each of us through the risen Christ. Dear God, our community is teeming with those who live with worries about old age, about losing jobs or failing finances, who have relationship issues, about where healthy food will come from, and those who have felt their faith weaken and their spirit losing its way. Lord, we implore you to make your presence known to our community of faith in your own way, that we may feel your strength in this time when we struggle to find ways to be strong for each other. We know you are persistent in your watch over our spirits. We ask your blessings on this congregation and especially on Pastor Daniel as he leads us through the turbulent and conflicting times in which we live. Above all, Lord, accept our thanks and praise for this day, this community of faith, and for your steadfast love as shown through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. grow thin, 
I see the blue above it, and day by day the pathway smooths, since first I learned to love it. A piece of Christ may stretch my heart, a fountain ever springing, all things are mine since I am here. How can I keep? Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today, I want to talk about discipleship, the meaning of following Jesus. Our willingness to follow Jesus, wherever he will lead us, whatever he will ask of us, and whomever he will send us to minister to, evaporates rather quickly to thin air as we realize that discipleship is not all that it's cut out to be, day in and day out. 
it suddenly dawns upon us that Jesus is serious when he says, I want you to count the cost of following me. And we need to be prepared to take risks, count the costs, that living out our faith on a daily basis is a requirement in order for us to pick up our crosses. And quite honestly, some of the rewards we will reap will include persecution and rejection. Suddenly, following Jesus is not nearly as attractive or easy as we imagined it to be. And yet it all began on such a promising note. The twelve were not only present during the giving of the Sermon on the Mount, they were its primary target audience. With their own eyes they watched as Jesus cleansed the leper from his disease witnessed Jesus healing a Roman centurion's servant. Still a fierce storm on Lake Gennesaret set free two demon-possessed men across the lake and make a paralyzed man walk once again. Each of these twelve first disciples saw their rabbi perform miracles speak in parables, experience with Jesus the grief over the execution of Jesus' cousin John the Baptist, and following Jesus' blessing, five loaves and two fish, they were the ones who distributed all that food, miraculous food, that fed more than not only 5,000 men, but their wives and children on top of that. Each disciple, you can say, has had his mountaintop experiences as well as sloughing through the valley of despair and failure. They nursed their share of sore feet, learned how to ignore growling and empty stomachs, combated the sheer endless nights of sleeping under the stars, shivering in the cold, and had their minds boggled day in and day out by what they witnessed and what they saw with their own eyes. Moments of genuine joy, happiness, elation, helped balance out the long and difficult days of wandering from one town or one village to another. Not quite sure where they were going to eat, if they were going to eat, or whether they would be having a roof over their head that night. But for the most part, these twelve would tell us that following Jesus was the best decision that they had ever made. Just don't ask them why they follow Jesus. Bartholomew, Judas, Simon, John, why do you follow Jesus? Their response might be something like this. Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. It was exciting. It was something brand new. It pulled us out of whatever life we were in, of the monotony. But now that you ask like this, we don't really know why we follow Jesus. And hearing you talk like you did, it sure does sound like Jesus is asking an awful lot of us, doesn't it? Maybe 12 of us should be together and spend some time discussing this before we take one more step. We don't know. Why do we follow Jesus? And why do we continue following Jesus? But today is no time for idle talk. 
The disciples have barely finished picking up the leftover bread and fish from the miraculous feast. Twelve baskets full of it, as Matthew is quick to tell us. When Jesus orders them to get into their boat and sail on to the other side without him. He himself would stay on for a while, dismiss the people and spend the night in prayer as he so often did before. Dutifully, the twelve set out on their trip. But soon, the seemingly simple task of steering the boat across the lake turns into a life-threatening and terrifying experience. Practically without much warning, as it happens in this location even to this day, a storm brews and it approaches fast. The sheer power of the storm is enough to frighten even the most seasoned sailors among them. With the wind and the rain lashing out and battering them, them as we are told, from dusk until dawn. So fierce is the storm that even while they occasionally catch a glimpse of the distant shore, they give up any hope of ever reaching safe harbor because the wind is against them. Then, in the first light of the new dawn, one of them spots a small spot on the horizon, a figure that is walking on the waves. Terrified of this new and completely unexpected vision, thinking that perhaps the ghost of a drowned fisherman is coming towards them and beckoning them to join him in their watery grave, they cry out in fear and terror. It is in moments like these Moments when life hits you right between the eyes that you begin to ask yourself some questions. Questions like, is it really worth it? All this trouble? Following Jesus sounds good in theory, but in reality, well, the dangers, the difficulties, the hardships, the, between us, the fringe benefits are hardly worth it all. Wouldn't it be better, provided we ever make it out of this current predicament we are in, to simply leave Jesus, return to our homes and our previous occupations, and let Jesus do whatever it is Jesus needs to do? He can do it himself. Why should the tough always get going? Meanwhile, the lonely figure has come close enough for them to be able to hear its voice. A voice that is familiar, a voice that is louder than the howling wind and the chattering of their teeth. It is I, fear not. Jesus identifies himself by using the ancient name of God, I am. Jesus popping up in the most unexpected moments, in the most unlikely places, telling us to stay cool, calm and collected. What are we to do about Jesus? How are we to respond to Jesus? From Matthew's telling of this incident, we can discern two possible responses to Jesus. The first response is found in Peter's words. If you really are who you claim to be, prove it. Make me get out of this boat. Walk on the water and come to you. And all that Jesus says to Peter is, come. 
and all that Jesus says to you and me is come. What is it you seek today? What will make you get out of your boat? Is it proof that Jesus does indeed care amidst all the raging storms that engulf you in your life at this point in time? Proof that you are not merely following a figment of our human imagination, some kind of Marvel comic figure whose promises are so outrageous they will never be able to be really fulfilled. If proof is what you seek, then you might want to take the approach that Peter has taken. Take a step in faith and get your proof. Step out of the relative security of your boat, for that is the only way that you will ever walk on water and find the answers you are looking for. But let me issue a word of caution here. Proof alone will not sustain you in the long run. Peter realizes this very shortly after stepping out of the boat and beginning to walk on water. For what is happening is Peter turns his eyes away from Jesus and begins to take in the world around him. And that world has not changed. The wind still batters the waves, sends them crashing over the boat. The shore is still very far away, safe harbor nowhere in sight. Becoming frightened again then, Peter has lost sight of what is really and truly important. The one thing that really matters when one is following Jesus. No matter the storm, no matter the economy, no matter the ebb and flow of a global pandemic. It is in this precise moment that Peter realizes that there is a second response, a much better one, a much more important one. When he cries to Jesus, Lord, save me. No amount of so-called proof for the existence of God is able to sustain us in the long run. Neither will it strengthen us, help or enable us to cope with the difficult circumstances of life. It is the saving grace of Jesus Christ that can accomplish what scientific or philosophical proof never can. The word salvation literally means Deliverance from a dire predicament. Lord, save me. Peter missed the point when he thought that his immediate need was to know that God was for real. Or perhaps even just find out what is it about Jesus that he is able to walk on water and we have to sit in a boat. Peter's most pressing need was to be safe, to find security in the midst of the turmoil and chaos that surrounded him. Matthew tells us Jesus immediately reached out his hand, caught him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got back into the boat, the storm ceased. The saving grace of Jesus, that is why I still follow him to this day. It matters little how many books proving the existence of God that I have read in my life. I follow Jesus because he came and save the wretch like me, because I once was blind, 
But now I see, I once was lost, but now am found. I don't want anybody to get offended by the word wretch, a wretch like me. John Newton, the author of the hymn Amazing Grace, when he says wretch, he's talking about someone who is so utterly lost, so utterly an outcast because of his or her sins that there is no chance in hell, quite literally, that we will ever to be able to save ourselves out of this predicament. I follow Jesus because he delivered me from my destructive past and because he gave me security, purpose, meaning, and life abundant. And even though my life isn't always the way I think it should be, and circumstances and situations arise that make me think that there is no light at the end of the tunnel, such as this never-ending pandemic, apparently, this coming and going of infections and deaths and more and more, I can truthfully and sincerely echo the words of one of our hymns. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms of God. Leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning on the everlasting arms of God. Why do you follow Jesus? Is it because you want proof that he really cares? Or is it because you find yourself lost, anchorless in a sea of raging waves and winds, desperately looking for a savior? Only you know the answer to this question. But know this, Christ stretches out his hand, ready to deliver you of the chaos that surrounds you and pull you into safe harbor and a life abundant. Will you grasp his saving hand? Listen once more to Jesus' life-giving words. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In these times when we're not able to meet together as a group, it's perhaps more important than ever that we work diligently to sustain the giving for the work of the church, which goes on and on. If you are um, watching today, obviously you can write a check out and uh, it's your choice whether you make it out to the Leland Summer Church Program or to Leland Community United Methodist Church. Um, and just mark that in your remarks section, your memo section. Either of those can be mailed to P.O. Box 602, Leland, Michigan, um, 49654, or you can go on our website, Leland Community UMC, that's all one word, dot org. And there, there's a tab for give and click on that and follow the prompts and you may uh, use the website to, to offer or make your offering. Um, so now God gives us the opportunity to share from our bounty for the ministries of our church that Christ's redeeming love may be known to all people. Let us joyfully receive our morning offering. Let us pray. Lord, receive our gifts 
and our lives. Cause all of these blessings to work for you in this world, which you have loaned to us for safekeeping. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I have good news for you. Unless something dramatic happens next Sunday, we will regather for the first time in almost four months for in-person worship here at the Leland Community Methodist Church. We will meet at 9.30 a.m. The Reverend Todd Jaffe is going to be our guest speaker for the Leland Summer Church service. We do require people to register ahead of time. You will find a link in, um, on our Facebook page, or you can go to our church website, lelandcommunityumc.org, and you can register right there. It's important that you let us know how many people will be in your family. We are limited at 70, and once the 70 has been reached, then the registration is closed for that particular Sunday. You will find more information on 
what to expect when you come on August the 2nd in a video we will post on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. And now let us share together in the benediction. Go forth with joy, celebrating all the many ways we have to serve God and our neighbor. May God give you courage, hope, peace, and love that you might bear these gifts to others. Go in the peace of Christ. Amen.